Good afternoon, Ehab. Thanks for taking time to see us. It's been a busy couple of weeks at the club. What was your overall assessment of the January transfer window? So it was a little bit of a stressful window, this one. Obviously, a lot of plays in on the last day. We were hoping to do a little bit more with, uh, with one extra play, but there was a few complications. Uh, still trying to resolve that with FIFA and the Premier League, so fingers crossed. Uh, but it was a tough window just because uh, in, in the January window, nobody really wants to sell. The only people buying are the clubs who are, are struggling and have to make a change. If you look at the top teams in, in the Premier League, very, very few changes there. The majority of the changes are happening down at the bottom end of the table. Uh, the clubs you're dealing with and the players, agents that you're dealing with, they all know you're under pressure, so they're always trying to squeeze you. That's why the deals tend to be done later in the, in, in the window rather than earlier in the window. So it's tough. It was a very tough window in that regard, but in general, you know, very pleased with the window. So with seven players joining the club in January, how would you describe the process of recruiting that's involved you and Marco? It was tough because when I first met Marco and we discussed the squad and well, we felt we were short, we only discussed three players at the time. Uh, and then obviously after coming in and, and he spent a bit of time with the team and with a couple of outs, obviously that was bound to increase and in, in particular with the injuries. So I think we started off discussing three, then with the injuries to Henriksen and Mason that became five, then with the two coming out that became seven. And it, you know, fingers crossed, they, there may still be one more to come in. Uh, so the numbers quickly increased, but you know they was they were circumstances beyond our control, really, with the outs and with the injuries. It's a very high calibre of players. How much has Marco's influence been in attracting these sorts of players to Hull City? Influential, really. I think uh, the fact that we were backing Marco. You know, obviously, I wasn't going to bring in a new manager and make significant changes if I then wasn't going to back him. So. I think he knew I was going to back him all the way. Uh, we had discussed this in the interview process and in the first few days of him arriving. Obviously it takes a few days for him to assess what he's actually got in the group of people. Uh, he made significant changes to the way we train, the intensity of training. Uh, he's very, very thorough, even looking on, on the actual provision of food, what they're eating, the nutrition, taking out uh, the desserts from the menu, so he's, he, you know, he's been very, very strict, very thorough. On Marco Silva, some commentators and experts saw it as a slightly left field choice and not the normal manager choice. Tell us how he came about becoming head coach of Hull City. We first looked at Marco in the summer. We received his, his CV through an agent in the summer. It was reviewed along with all of the other applicants in the summer, which of, of, of which there were many applicants in the summer, you know, whether it's been promoted to the Premier League. Uh, at the time, Mick was hungry for the job, he was passionate, he was hungry, he had a fantastic start, seven points out of the first three games. Uh, at the time we were also looking to sell the club and with, with discussions with the three potential buyers at the time, they all liked Mike and the stability of keeping him. So that was the obvious choice at the time uh, and that is the one which we made at the time and it was right at the time. Then. The following results went so good and uh, the potential buys fell away as, as we dropped to the bottom of the table and it reached the point where I thought, well, okay, if, we, if we're serious about staying in this league, then unfortunately, although Mick is a lovely guy and, uh, and had such an amazing start and uh, I wanted to give him more time, we didn't have the luxury of time and I felt if we didn't make a change when we did, then I th I think the season was lost really, so it was a tough decision, a tough call, but it was one which we had to make. Uh, I immediately went back to the applicants from the summer, uh, I, sh I shortlisted those down to three, which included Marco, and when I looked really into a lot of detail in the three, Marco was the, was the standout of, the, of those three. And again, he was very keen, very hungry. He reviewed the last three or four matches, he could see the potential in the squad, but he felt that he could add something more to the organisation uh, and to uh, a, a, a slight change in philosophy, change in formation. He could see some of the mistakes he felt the team were making and he th thought he could have a, a positive influence on the performances. Did you see it as a gamble at all, going for someone with no Premier League experience versus a more 
proven English manager perhaps? No, not at all. If anything, it was the contrary. Uh, you know, when I looked at, I didn't really want to join the merry-go-round uh, of just recycling existing UK managers. That isn't really what I wanted. I wanted somebody who was used to success. Uh, and that was in, in, important for me because to get ourselves out of the bottom of the league and, and to dig ourselves out of this hole, I think we needed to readjust the attitude of the squad and we needed a winning mentality. We will not survive unless we want to win. And that was key for me to have someone who was used to winning. And Marco's teams are used to winning. Marco is used to winning. He has a winning attitude and that for me was key. I don't want somebody who is up and down in various clubs in the Premier League and with the churn of manager, I don't think that was the type of attitude that I wanted to bring into the club. I wanted to bring in a winning mentality and that's what Marco has. The players recently have talked about his change of training techniques and style, intensity. What has impressed you most about these new methods? Well, first of all, it's, it's something I haven't seen before. Uh, you know, obviously I've experienced four, four uh, of the previous managers, starting with Nigel Pearson, Nick Barnby, Steve Bruce, and then Mick Phelan. And I remember the first training session uh, under Marco watching that, and I thought, wow, this is so different to what we've had before, and this will be a shock to the system for the players. But a welcome shock to the system, you know, because I think a lot of the players were... Uh, recognise the need for change in the way we train and the way we prepare. He's so thorough, uh, uh, so hungry to win and you can see that coming through in his thoroughness uh, and, the in, and the intensity of the training. So far he's had some great results, notably at home. How do you see our chances of survival this season? I'm actually very positive. If you look at it, if you look at the style of play, the way we're playing, even when we've lost, I thought we've actually played well. If you look at the Chelsea game in particular, OK, we, I think it was a 2-0 a loss, but my God, did we play well that game. And I think we deserved more out of the game than we did. So it isn't just the fact that we've started winning. I think we've won all of our home games so far. Let's hope that can continue tomorrow against Liverpool. I know it's a tall order, but again, uh, I hope we can get something out of the game, but even when we haven't got the results or the points that we wanted, you can see the the lift in the team spirit and in the team performances, and uh, I'm very, very hopeful of staying up this season now. In terms of transfers, has Marco always had the final say on the ins and outs? Yeah, of course, on the ins and outs, I want to support the manager, I want to give him all of the tools that he needs to, you know, to be successful and, and to keep us in, in this division. So. Of, of course he has to approve everything, ins and outs. Obviously a high number of the ins have been on loan. Is that a strategic decision or is it just due to the availability in the January window? A little bit of both. Uh, the reason for loans over acquisitions, I suppose you, it's always a preference to buy when you can. But then at the time, bottom of the table, I insist on the relegation clauses in every single contract. Uh, you know, just to be cautious and it's the right thing to do. So in that sense, when you're bottom of the league, it is a struggle sometimes to get enough players who are motivated to come with a relegation clause. So in those instances, the loans are uh, fairly ideal because the player isn't taking a risk. For some markets, such as France, etc., even with the relegation, it's more than they're on in, in, in their domestic league, so it's easy to attract those on a permanent deal. But with some of the bigger players, obviously, they, they won't take the risk. With the loans, is there still quite a significant financial commitment? Yeah, of course, I think in this window, well, I think this season alone, uh, between summer and now, loan fees, about £7 million. I think just in this window, it's over £5 million just in this one window, just on loan fees, and that's not including wages. Obviously, some fans were concerned with the sale of Robert Snodgrass and Jake Livermore from the club. Can you talk us through how that evolved as a process? In a process, I... I think, like I've already mentioned, the intention was to support Marco as much as possible. We'd identified the number of players coming in and where he felt the weaknesses were in the squad, and that's where we intended to strengthen. Again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, with the injuries to both Mason and Henriksen, we, we did have to replace those two players. Uh, and then 
the change of style of play. Unfortunately, that, that hasn't suited everybody and some players wanted to leave, some players were more vocal about wanting to leave, some were more diplomatic, but at the end of the day, we are in a survival fight and we need everybody pulling in the same direction. We didn't want to sell any players at all. You know, the idea was to regroup and to strengthen. Uh, but unfortunately, when certain circumstances present themselves, you have to deal with them the best you can. All of the decisions were run through with Marco. With the change in the style of play, it meant some people who may have been regular starters would have been on the bench uh, when you, so, it's difficult for some players to accept, having started every game, to then become on the bench. Difficult for them to accept and they start to look for a move themselves. And you always know when agents approach you saying we found a club for the player, they're not doing that by themselves on their own, that's with full knowledge of the player. Uh, so when players want to leave and you're in a survival fight and you want everybody to be pulling in the same direction, everybody to be fully motivated, then obviously you need to make the right decision with with the manager's approval uh, and in both cases spoke to the manager look at the end of the day you need to manage these players I can make the decision now but you need to manage these players post window so I want you to have the final say if these if 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 these players stay or go do you feel that the deals achieved for both players represented good business for the football club Yes, we could have achieved higher amounts uh, when it became public knowledge that the players may be moving out. We, we received higher offers from other clubs. Uh, the decision to let them go wasn't financially motivated, it was they want to go, we need to re-strengthen. Uh, and, 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 and the evidence of it not being financially motivated is in both cases we received higher offers from other clubs, both of the other clubs who made offers uh, were in similar positions to us and, and fighting against us for survival, so we didn't want to sell to rivals. Some fans questioned whether the money would instantly be reinvested in the squad. Has that been the case? Yes, of course. Uh, the motivation was never to generate cash. It was to support Marco with the best squad possible for him, that works for him, uh, and to give ourselves the best opportunity of actually staying in the Premier League this season. Uh, so yes, I had agreed with Marco, if something wasn't working, if there were certain players not fitting in his future plans, then we would sell uh, and to reinvest that, which is exactly what we have done. Uh, I know with the recent transfers on, on, on the last day and, and the loan fees that we've paid and potentially one more player coming in, on a, you know, that's another big signing. Uh, then we'll have spent considerably more than the value of sales. The press always exaggerate uh, the sales figures. I know it was widely reported that I think on the sale of the two players that it was 20 million pounds. That's exaggerated. It was 16 million plus 4 million worth of contingents for the two players. Uh, and I think when you look at what we've actually spent, in particular if, if, uh, if we can get this final deal over the line, then it's considerably more than the value of sales. Some fans see numbers quoted uh, from TV money in the Premier League, about £200 million instantly available to Premier League clubs on promotion to spend on players. Could you explain how that money is structured and how much actually is available instantly? Yeah, I think uh, what's reported in the press is uh, the value of the promotion to the club. And the figure is in, in, in the high 100s, I suppose, when you consider what you're guaranteed for the first year in the Premier League and then the subsequent parachute payments over a three to four year period, you are probably guaranteed about 180 million. What you get in the first year is around half of that. Uh, it's not paid in one go. It is, it, there are two lump sums in, in, in the two transfer windows and then the rest is drip fed monthly. And in addition to the money received, obviously there are contingent payments from the previous year that, that consumes some of the cash you're receiving this year. So with the bonuses to the coaching staff and the players for the promotion, that wasn't obviously in, the, in last year's budget, that, that has to come out of this year's cash. Uh, you then have the, com the contingent amount on the player contracts to other clubs. So where we've bought players from bigger clubs such as Tottenham, they're a contingent amount based on appearances and if the club is promoted. So all that cash is consumed out of the first lump sum that you receive in August. Uh, then with the new player acquisitions, it's, 
it's surprising how quickly you can go through the money in the Premier League when you look at the size of the wages. Our wage bill now, we're actually paying in excess of £5 million a month just in play wages. That's not then including the running costs of uh, uh, of the backroom staff at the training ground, the you know, actual facilities, the stadium facilities, the stewarding, the policing, all of the admin staff, the commercial team, all those costs are in addition to that. So it's it's surprising when you get to the Premier League, it's so easy to spend the money. You earlier mentioned that players have clauses in their contract for relegation. How important is that for the club? Oh, it's extremely important because your income uh, is significantly reduced on a relegation. I think you, you, you maybe lose 70% of your income, 65 to 70% of your income is lost. And our relegation clauses are anywhere between 40 to 50%. But the income is actually dropping more rapidly than that. So the calibre of the players that we've brought in obviously is very clear, or international experience, playing for big clubs, some for big transfer fees. What do you think it is about Hull that has meant we've been able to attract them in January? Obviously being in the Premier League itself, it, it, it's an opportunity you know, to play in the biggest league in the world really. Uh, very good players, very good quality, very good experience. Uh, and I think the fact that I know with a couple of the players in particular, the big name players who we have bought in, uh, they have watched the last few games under Marco, been really impressed with Marco and the way the team is performing. Uh, and that's really what has got them to buy into coming to Hull. Do you feel like some of them may have a point to prove at this stage in their career? I think they're such good quality, I don't think they have a point to prove. I think you know, some of the players weren't necessarily getting the game time uh, with their home club and felt it was a, a very good opportunity to play in the Premier League and to get the game time and to, and to showcase themselves, really. Do you feel that a six-month loan deal a player of that calibre is actually more beneficial than tying a lesser quality player to a longer term deal perhaps? I think it's win-win for both really, you know, they are big players, they are players who deserve to be in the Premier League but then haven't had the opportunity in the past in some cases but the quality of these players, they, they, they certainly deserve uh, you know, to be playing in this league uh, and I think it's, it's a win-win for both really. So tomorrow's visit of Liverpool represents the second sellout of the season. How important is it that the fans have got behind Marco in the running for the rest of the season? Yeah, I think Marco's already come out publicly and said that the, that the team need the backing of the fans. It does make a difference. He wants them to be more vocal, uh, which I think is important for the team. That's why the family is staying away because we don't want any distractions here. It, it's not about the off, you know, what is happening off field. You know, during those ninety minutes, it's about the team results and supporting them and and that's all it can be about you know I'm actually really pleased that the fans are getting behind the team uh, whatever differences we may have we can look at those separately but for those 90 minutes and to try and fight for survival we need the backing of the fans it's crucial